Hello and welcome to episode four of the Wilder podcast. Chloe, good morning. Morning, everybody. So today's actually our first proper normal inverted commas episode. So what can we expect from that, Chloe? Well, I think our intention is to start each episode with a little update around what's been happening on the farm over the last couple of weeks. And I know that Tom is very excited to share some stats with you about the podcast. Yeah, we both are. <laughs> Not just me. No, I, I get the daily update. So you lucky people just get it for the, the two-week overview. It's like, Glow, look at these downloads. But no, <laughs> first, I think it's important to start with thank you to everyone that's listening to the podcast, providing the feedback, doing the rating, reviewing. It makes a massive difference and really gives us energy and motivation. By the time you're listening to this podcast, we've kind of gone into the thousands of downloads, which is pretty awesome for saying that we don't really have any kind of social media following before this. So it's just organically growing. Yeah, I find it really strange to think there are so many people out there downloading the podcast. But the thing I really appreciate is when people reach out to us and send an email kind of talking about their experience of the podcast and what they took from the interviews. Believe it, Chloe. Um, I've got some more stats for you. 21 countries worldwide have downloaded wow. this so far. <laughs> um, you know, pretty big, obviously, United Kingdom is a good contingent over in the United States. Germany, uh, UAE, uh, which is surprising, but great. You know, welcome. Glad you're listening. France, Italy, Mexico, Portugal, South Africa, but all the way. Isle of Man, thank you very much, listener over there. Um, mm-hmm. Singapore, Philippines, Netherlands, there's so many more as well. So it's, I'm really buoyed up by this, and hopefully we can take this podcast places and educate and inform. Anyway, that's my bit of geeking off done. What's next? The next update is we have some big news around our kind of ecology team moving forward. Um, Tom and I have met with a number of different ecologists over the last few weeks, and I think we've really found someone that has a great fit for kind of our vision and aspiration and the approach we want to take in moving the project forward. Yeah, would would that team call themselves ecologists or consultant rewilders or wilders experts? But it's a sorry, not sorry. We actually can't announce it just yet because we haven't quite signed the partnership with them. But needless to say we've done a lot of research a lot of work and we found someone that really fits with our aspirations and inspires us but on the process i've got some really great exciting ideas that will be of interest to everybody yeah and particularly people that like to follow the journey visually as well as in the audio world like it like it you're right so i think we're looking ready to go into- oh hang on tommy you've forgotten about the most important update of the week Tom has literally been nurturing these spinach seeds like his life depends on it. They are, they've taken more time than the children. They've been, the, how do we kind of qualify what is damp enough has been a regular point of discussion in our household. And I, I swear if he could sit and watch them all day, he would. Makes me happy. I've taken a photo of them every single day, so don't worry. And on that note, though, it is worth, uh, in the show notes will be a link to the YouTube video where I put together uh, just a short clip, my first foray into YouTube videos just to show our no dig veg patch, how we built it. And then me kind of putting whatever it is, putting my seeds in the first <laughs> seed pots. Because I think, you know, it's I really haven't done this before and it's not my natural habitat, so to speak. So the fact that I can do it and it seems to be working, we've got things happening. I'm assuming they're not weeds and I think they are spinach. The irony is Tom doesn't even like spinach. I know. <laughs> I'm going to love this spinach. I could tell you that. And that's an interesting thing. I am really excited about eating it because I've grown it, even though it's not my favorite thing to eat, even though, you know, Popeye and all that. <laughs> right. Uh, and I have to say, they're set in the kitchen. There is a really lovely thing to watch. Every, and literally every day they grow a bit more. You can you can almost see them growing in front of you. So I would encourage anyone that is wondering about whether they want to get into any growing. This part of the process is fun so far. And the kids love it. Yeah. Well. Right. I think we're witted on enough. And I'm, I think this interview is well worth the wait. Chloe, would you like to introduce our guest? I would love to. So we were really privileged to be joined by Professor Tom Crowther, who is a professor based at the Crowther Labs in Zurich. And he specializes in thinking about the interface between biodiversity and climate change. And he's particularly interested in kind of using big data to help inform that. But a kind of couple of fun facts about Tom. So the first of all, he did his PhD at the University of Cardiff, which means he's got some Welsh connections and this, I presume spent a lot of time in the Welsh landscapes mm-hmm. as part of that. It was really great to kind of have that connection with us in the Monmouthshire Hills. And one of the other things that Tom is really noteworthy for is his work around trees. He's done some interesting work around counting how many trees there are on earth. So they estimate around three trillion. And has also thought about the potential to plant additional trees globally and without affecting urban land use or agricultural use, um, which is a really kind of interesting proposition, which created a lot of debate. But I think good science does create debate. But the theme of our conversation with Tom today was really introducing us to the biodiversity crisis, what that means, and some really inspiring work about what's happening out there to try and address this crisis. 
Yeah, and, and Todd, there's so much more to Tom and his work and his team's work than just headlines about the research he's done, the big data around trees. But that's just what's grabbed the headlines. And it's really exciting to show how big data can be practically applied to making global change. And that's one of the things we cover in the, this chat. And that's absolutely one of the things that Thomas, we recognise for, ha has been his capacity to generate global change. And so we're really excited to share this conversation with you. Welcome, Tom. Hi, thanks very much for having me. We always say every episode now is staggering the generosity of the guests and the people that are doing some amazing things in this space and, and them giving us a bit of time to help educate us and through us, hopefully our listeners as well. So thank you so much for giving us your time. Oh, great. Thank you for doing what you do. It's really exciting to see all these perspectives come together. So uh, in keeping with tradition, uh, could I ask you to introduce yourself because no one knows you better than yourself. All right. Yeah, I'm Tom Crowther. I'm an ecologist. I study how organisms interact to shape the climate and the world we live in. And I'm a professor of ecology at ETH Zurich in Switzerland. And I'm also the chair of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, where we facilitate restoration efforts all around the world. Yeah. Awesome. You are the right person to get on for this topic then. We have chosen to try talk about biodiversity and specifically kind of referring it to a, the silent crisis. And when we came across this topic, I think Chloe and I spoke to each other and just said it really is relevant to us because even though we just three months ago we made the move to try and do our bit to support the earth as little as it may be it took us about six months of our journey of researching the climate crisis before we really started it and it was all about at that time it was all about carbon carbon sequestration trees and it, six months in it was when we started to hear about biodiversity and the biodiversity loss that's happening across the globe and it is petrifying but I still think it's a topic I don't know enough about, so I'm glad that you're here. Would it be possible for you to help educate our listeners on what we mean by referring to it as the silent crisis and why is it critical to um, address? Yeah, sure. I guess by silent crisis, we mean it's a global crisis that underpins all of the other global crises. Everything that we need to survive on this planet is provided by biodiversity. If you imagine we go back, whatever, three billion years, this planet was completely inhospitable. And there's no way we're surviving in that toxic gases and volcanic acids everywhere. And that all changed as a result of the miraculous emergence of life, which still scientists struggle to explain. We still don't really know how it came about. But once it did come about, what life did is it started changing everything. And every new species transformed the atmosphere a little bit more so that other species could survive. And then every new species that emerged made shade so that another species could survive or made a new environmental conditions that a new species could emerge. And what we find is that over the next few billion years, that proliferation of species has built an environment that is like a haven for us to thrive in with all the different, you know, billions of species providing countless services that we need to survive, like the air and the water we drink and the medicines we use. And we've got to a point where obviously we could never have survived without that biodiversity that underpins everything. And we are now at this point where there's all these emergent global threats, which are both underpinned by biodiversity and they are threatening biodiversity, which puts us in this dangerous sort of cycle. So I'm, I guess I'm curious, Tom, about why do you think it's described as the silent crisis given is foundational to our entire existence? Yeah, I think it's referred as the silent crisis because it's the hardest one for you to see or notice or feel. We clearly were all affected directly by the global pandemic. You know, pandemics are a big global threat we're, we're very aware of. Climate change, maybe we're slightly less able to feel it. It's global warming. It's it's affecting the Arctic ice melt. It's affecting the dry lands and, and, the, and the tropical regions. And we're feeling it a little bit, but it's threatening our entire civilization. But biodiversity loss is something for most of us that's happening elsewhere in another part of the world, in another existence, and it doesn't directly affect us until maybe we see a YouTube video where an orangutan's lost its home. We don't notice the billions of microbial species that are being lost or the thousands of bird species that are being disrupted. And so we don't notice it. And so maybe we don't prioritize it. And no one thinks this is the highest priority, but actually it couldn't be more fundamental to our existence. And I guess what, what concerns you most about the biodiversity loss and the crisis that you're exploring? Well, uh, quite a lot of things. <laughs> I'll bring you where to start. I think actually awareness, I, I'm going to just go very high level. Our lack of awareness for it 
is probably my biggest concern right now. You mentioned it in the intro, there's a lot of talk about climate change and fighting climate change. For that, we need emissions cuts, we need to decarbonize our economy, and we need nature. But nature is often seen as this afterthought, like, oh yeah, we'll get some nature so that we can store some, you know, billions of tons of carbon. But that's not the only reason we'd need nature. We, even if nature stored zero carbon, we still need it exactly as desperately. We fundamentally couldn't survive in any way. We couldn't breathe a drop of air if it weren't for the biodiversity that's, that's currently being threatened. And so it's this big and looming threat as we continue to lose those species. And we're not even really recognizing how important it is. The COP every year that all the, the rich and famous come to meet to discuss <laughs> what, what should happen around climate. The climate COP is huge. The biodiversity COP is tiny. It's just a few people rocking up and it needs to get to the same scale as the climate crisis, I think, in our minds. I like diluting things down to things I understand. So, and I don't know whether this is accurate, but I, I really have felt over the, you know, the years that on my windscreen in my car, it really has been fewer and fewer bugs splatting on that. Yeah, am I making that up or is that our reality? And that is one of the indicators, again, for the average, average person on the street of this biodiversity loss. It's definitely one of many indicators. Yeah. I totally remember the same thing. Driving around in, in Wales, you'd have to like clean the bugs flat yeah. off the window. I don't think anyone ever does that anymore. It's, it's, it's like a thing of the past. And it's, that is just like one of the little indications that something's different. We live in a completely different world already. And it's all the invisible things that you haven't noticed that are disappearing. And, and you might think, oh, well, that's, they were just some annoying bugs on my windscreen. But those are the bugs that pollinate all of our crops that allow the survival of the forests that store all of the carbon and that trap all the, all the moisture and nutrients in the soil. These are fundamental to our survival and they're gradually going down. What are the primary human activities that are leading to biodiversity loss? Biggest ones are land use change. We use up land like no species ever did before. And so we have to provide food for an ever-growing human population. So agricultural land footprint is very big. At the moment, there's a huge amount of deforestation and land clearing for meat production. So for the cattle grazing around the tropics, which is really a big land use threat. Obviously, we're seeing increased prevalence of fires for land clearing as well. But we're also seeing that climate change is threatening biodiversity now. And that's also increasing the prevalence of fires. And it's also changing the environmental conditions in a unprecedented way so that some of the species that were there can't survive. And what's really scary is when the climate changes such that one of the species disappears, maybe the rest of the species can survive it. But then another species disappears and maybe the rest of the community can survive it. But once three or four or five or six species start to disappear or move their migratory patterns or emerge in a different way, all the other species that depend on that food web also start to collapse. And we're seeing these like tipping points where ecosystems are collapsing uh, as a result of these very slow levels of degradation. That is bleak to say the least. And just to take it to the, I, wouldn't, I don't want to say natural conclusion, but a hypothetical conclusion, if it continues to go unchecked, what are the risks and what are the things we're going to start to notice as it gets worse? So this isn't something I can say definitively because no one knows the future. And we make climate models that predict the future all the time. And I guess I'll start with an optimistic note is that the one thing our climate models can never account for is human innovation. Like every now and again, an invention comes along or a solution comes along that allows us to transform the way we live. And so I would never say that the future is doomed. But to come back to your question specifically, if this were left unchecked and we did continue to lose species the way we are now, what would happen, I think, is that the human population would fall dramatically because all the things that we need to eat and breathe and drink and use for everything else that we use would be gone, would be diminished. The human population would fall dramatically, but I don't think it would disappear. What would happen is that reduction in the human population would probably reduce our footprint on nature and nature would recover. I'm very confident in the ability of nature to regenerate itself. It's this immensely magical and powerful system and it will recover. The question is, do we want to stop our degradation before we have this massive collapse of the human population? Or can we find a way that we can still be here while nature recovers? And that's obviously what our work and everything that we do aims to achieve. Maybe that's a good point to hear a little bit more about your work, Tom, because I know that you've been thinking a lot about some of these challenges and how best to go about addressing them. Cool. Yeah. So we work on this sort of at the nexus between climate change and biodiversity, because 
nature and biodiversity is critical for carbon storage that we need to fight climate change. You know, you, we can't achieve our climate targets unless we have nature. So we do a lot of work understanding the global scale of forests. We model forests and grasslands and peatlands and wetlands to show how big they are, how much carbon they store, and how much carbon they could store in the future if we were to revitalize them. And you do see this incredible potential of nature. We could store hundreds of gigatons of carbon in regenerating forests and peatlands and grasslands. And that would put a big dent in our climate crisis, potentially up to about 30% of the climate contributions could be met by restoring nature. So that's one area that our work focuses on. But actually, when it comes to the practicalities of doing that, you can't achieve that with global scale predictions or global scale policies, because biodiversity, unlike the climate crisis, is a local scale challenge. Biodiversity is different in every field on the planet, in every region of the planet. There's a different mixture of species. There's a different mixture of people that live there who interact with that biodiversity. And so actually addressing biodiversity loss at a global scale really requires a very localized approach. And so the other side of our research is to understand what well, we study the needs of local people and the, and the needs of the biodiversity in different regions. And we've built sort of a digital platform, like a, almost like Google Maps, but for restoration. And it's called Restore, R-E-S-T-O-R. And essentially, it's just a Google Maps, but for everyone who's working with nature. So anyone with their community project or farm or back garden or rewilding project, all of those people can come into one place and they can show what they're doing and they can share information about what they're doing and they get ecological data about the lo local ecological information about the region. And they also get the ability to share, share information and exchange and sort of build a global environmental movement together out of all these millions of local heroes. I've been to a Restore webinar and it was probably the most inspirational thing that I've done so far in my rewilding journey to be surrounded by like-minded people. Now, it was a bit embarrassing. I'm there with my 80 acres and then you've got people you know, in Africa and other places that around the world who are restoring thousands, not tens of thousands of acres. So, you know, a little bit embarrassing for me chatting to them, but it was fascinating to chat to them. And it was the thing that's given me probably the most energy to keep kind of forging forwards. That's just an anecdotal feedback there for you there, Tom. <laughs> that, that is exactly the feedback we want. And you know what? It's actually matches the feedback we get a lot so many times. And it is the local projects that we want most of all. You know, the massive NGOs are great, but they're already doing fine. We need millions of local landowners and local communities in order to build a global restoration movement. The coolest thing is exactly what you just said. It's people all over the world are actually doing unbelievably inspiring things to rewild and bring back nature, but it's really hard. There's this off, often this feeling that they're doing it alone. You're in isolation. You're like, am I the only one in the world doing this? I don't know anyone else that's doing it to ask advice from, and I don't know if my contribution is just a drop in the bucket. But when you see that there's tens of thousands of other people doing it across the planet and you can like, learn from them and form the global movement, you really feel like your contributions are part of a bigger thing and it's and you know it's actually making a difference. So yeah, it's that community feeling that's the coolest thing. We're all about community here, Tom, so that's great to hear about the beneficial impacts of that. But I suppose I was wondering about if there's a particular project that you're aware of that you'd like to celebrate and share with our listeners. Yeah, I often get this question and it's so hard because I have we have 150,000 projects right now that are amazing. And how do you begin to answer that question? But because I always do need to answer that question, I always just give my last, the last example that I just <laughs> spoke to. And, and an hour and a half ago, I came off a call with a guy called Leitoro. His second name is Adrian, Leitoro Adrian. And he's from a community in Kenya called the Samburu community. And it, his story is unreal. If anyone in the planet spoke to him, they would no longer question about whether we need to save the world and how to save the world. He's an absolute legend. He lives in a region of Kenya where there's severe drought. It's a dryland region. The drought is increasing every year. And what they have is these water towers, but the water tower is actually just, it's patches of forest. And those forests trap water, you know, because of the existence of those trees provides shade and evapotranspiration and traps water and nutrients in the soil. Those water towers, provide the water that's needed to support all of their cattle. And they, they also have all of the medicinal trees that the local communities need for their medicines. When I spoke to him, I was like, right, but is medicine the main reason you need these trees? He was like, yeah, we use it. Or that is the only source of medicine we have. Most of our medicines come from these water towers. So there's, they need 
those trees for their livestock, for their livelihoods, and for the medicinal purposes. And obviously, he had been originally in his local community, there'd been, you know, massive shortages, decades of real suffering as a result of increasing drought and increasing drought intensity. And obviously what he did is he started recovering his local patch and he started that by planting trees, but the trees kept getting eaten by goats or dying because of the drought. So what he realized is actually there's little patches of trees that are recovering naturally. So instead of planting, he would just put fences around those little patches. And then what, what he's done is he learned from the village elder that actually when you, I can't remember what they call it, you, when you put a bit a dot of paint on a tree, according to the village elder, it is a protected tree. That tree is no longer allowed to be cut down. And as a result of that rule and the fence, those trees were able to recover, which then created shading and trapped water so that other trees could survive, which really rebuilt loads of these little water patches. Then the livestock started improving and doing better. And as a result, he and his local community have, have connected 18, 18 or 19 other local villages in the area. And all the village elders have all spoken to build this collective agreement around these painted trees that are now protected so that they can build little hot spots of biodiversity that trap water so that their livelihoods can be improved and their med medicines can be improved. And I guess this is one example. Obviously, it's so much cooler than I'm giving it justice to. It's way cooler than what I'm describing. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's really awesome. I mean, it's, and there's principles in this that are fundamental to every good restoration project. One is it's community led. It's not some corporation or NGO coming in and saying, you guys should do restoration. This is the community needed it so that they can thrive. And as a result, that's the only time restoration works. It's also, they found a brilliant solution where nature is the economic choice, or at least the choice for well-being. When nature is the economic choice, you don't need to work at it. It's not like so many of these restoration projects you see are like people trying to plant trees all over the place where trees don't naturally grow or where people don't want them. And that will never work. But when a community or a landscape or a network of communities want nature for their own well-being, you can't stop it from coming back. And that in the process is trapping tons and tons of water, tons of carbon, that's obviously helping us in the global fight against climate change and it's facilitating generations of people to continue living in that region. It's beautiful. I yeah. wish people could see Tom's passion here. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, it's coming across so strongly how, like, yeah, it's amazing to hear that story. And, and just quick, do you think he'd come on the podcast? I mean, in terms of hearing that story and making it cool, I think that's what we want. The Wilder podcast is about giving voices to projects, any project, any rewilding project. Yes. But the problem is, where do I begin? Because there's, I've got thousands of, yeah. like, he is a hero, better than anyone I've ever met. And yet there's thousands of them on Restore. So, but yeah. yeah, I will definitely, I can happily connect you with him. He would tell the story so much better. I guess it's so inspiring for me hearing about some of those global projects that really, I mean, as you say, embody a lot of those fantastic principles around using that local and indigenous knowledge and the collaboration and creating those corridors that connect which sounds amazing. So we'll take it to kind of a more of a global scale. Obviously, within the climate change world, you've got the kind of 1.5 target, and that's a big commitment that's been made through the COP process. I guess, are there similar targets that people should be aware of with regards to the biodiversity space? So yeah, last year was the first ever international agreement on biodiversity at the Biodiversity COP last year in Montreal. It's the Kunming Montreal Protocol. It has set our biodiversity targets for the planet. The tricky thing is, it's hard to really have a target like 1.5. You know, when we talk about temperature, yeah. it's quite simple. We don't want to go over that 1.5 or we don't yeah. want to go over those two degrees. With biodiversity, you could make it about the number of species that have been lost, but that doesn't really tell the whole story. You can make it about the amount of land that's been lost, but that also doesn't tell the whole story. So some of the most successful targets are things like 30 by 30. So this is the goal that we could protect 30% of the land surface by 2030. And that would make a huge step towards having a resilient planet. And if we could have nature recovering in that 30%, that would be unbelievable. And so that is a huge landmark agreement that we're going to try and you know move, push the world towards. These targets are always really good, but they should never be a limiting factor. If we achieve 30, we need to go for more. And I want to stress, when I talk about recovering nature, I don't just mean getting it back to full intact wilderness. Of course, I'd love that as much as possible, but it also means in every bit of agriculture, you can find solutions where bringing in new species or mixtures of species can increase your yields or bringing in soil microbiomes can improve your productivity. 
And so you can reintroduce bits of biodiversity into every part of the system to improve it. And so we want those incredible rewilding and renaturing projects, but we also want agriculture to turn regenerative and all sorts of other practices to bring back biodiversity. So Tom, in England at the moment, in the UK, but in England specifically, there's a lot of chat about BNGs, biodiversity net gain credits, where landowners benchline their biodiversity and then agree a 30-year plan and generate credits and then get paid quite a substantial amount of money to achieve those aims and, and increase the biodiversity on the site. I'm just really uh, curious to hear your reflections on that and what your thoughts on and whether or not it, it's going to achieve the mission. Okay. This is something we work on a lot. We've recently launched an initiative called SEED, which is a global biodiversity assessment that can say how complex the biodiversity is in every 10 meters on the planet and how it's changing over time so that people in the UK and elsewhere can measure their biodiversity and how it's improving or not. Now, the topic of credits and markets, I'm completely torn on, and I'll tell you why. In one respect, I think it's awesome if we can use the power of markets to channel funding towards farmers and landowners and the people who live with nature. That is everything about the goal. Clearly, we need to redistribute the wealth of our planet to the people who live in association with nature. So conceptually, that is actually why we started Seed in the first place. Conceptually, I want biodiversity credits to work. And I know that it will work in many places. And I should stress, the biodiversity market is exploding. It is going to become enormous and it is going to fund a lot of nature initiatives. Many of them will be good. The risk is a bit of a, I don't know if it's a philosophical one, but my concern is that as we've seen with other markets, what tends to happen is if you have saleable credits, so if you're a local farmer, and I can buy the credit from you, I have now bought the rights to the biodiversity on your land. Not only have you lost the rights to the biodiversity on your land, but I now can sell it on to someone else at a profit. And more than that, if I'm rich and you're not, I can buy a thousand of them or a million of them and sell them on for even more. And that doesn't seem like a problem fundamentally, because at least there's still money going to the farmer. But if we believe, and this is an if, if we believe that wealth disparity on the planet contributes to global degradation, and there's lots of arguments for why that is the case, if we believe that, then me as the person buying the credit getting richer and richer, and you as the farmer getting a one-off payment that helps is only going to drive that wealth inequality more. And so what I'd like to see with the development of these markets is somewhere in between. I do want the biodiversity credits to be able to empower landowners, but I don't want people to get credits that they can sell on. I don't want people to make more money on the back of what that farmer is doing or that landowner is doing. I think if you can buy a credit or a certificate and it looks good on your company's website, great. And you've contributed to the world, but you should not be able to sell that on and sell that on and sell that on and get richer and richer and richer. We should all be doing that, but particularly the big corporations should be doing that as a bit of a payback for the amount of exploitation that has happened across the planet that has led to us being in this situation. So I'm both positive, but also cautious. I'm really glad that I asked that question because that's actually really helped align things in my brain as well and sounds eminently sensible. Let's just hope that, <laughs> that permeates through to the powers of the bee. At the start of this interview, I asked you about what you're most concerned about and you talked about lack of awareness. I suppose I'm wondering about what things you feel hopeful about um, that's happening internationally or nationally that can increase that awareness. Yeah, people often ask me that question. Often, even more like they ask, if you're working in such a challenging or depressing topic, how can you stay hopeful? And I feel like it's the exact opposite. I work in a field that would make everyone optimistic. If everyone was working with the people that I encounter, like Laitoro, like if everybody was encountering those people on a daily basis, we would all be filled with optimism and we'd be filled with drive and we would all be saving the planet 10 times faster. So I'm actually in a very privileged position that I see on the Restore Network, tens of thousands of people just doing unbelievable stuff. And again, I want to stress, it's not necessarily the people who, who make a huge uh, sacrifice that are those heroes. Of course, they're heroes as well. When people give away their money or give away their land so that nature can recover, they are heroes too. But what I'm most inspired by is the amount of people who have found the solutions that make nature their economic choice or their choice for well-being. So again, me planting a load of trees in my garden to give to, the, to nature, that's nice. But what's amazing is when local communities find economic security or well-being 
as a result of rejuvenating nature. Because when, when you find that link between healthy people and healthy nature, that is when it spreads and you see it just taking off across landscapes. And then 10 years later, the landscape is green and flourishing and people and, and nature is thriving. And it's not only evidence that it's possible, but it's evidence that people can be a part of it. People are ecosystem engineers that are responsible or, or, or are the stewards of nature and they can make it better. It completely combats this idea that is touted by many politicians or many people is that our oh, nature comes at the expense of our economy. We have to remove nature to get economic well-being. That is fundamentally not the case. And currently, that is, I guess it is the case for more for most of us. But for these thousands of people, they found the way that healthy nature is the economic choice. And all we need to do is get more of us living the way they live. And that doesn't mean going and living in Kenya, but it just means recognizing that our footprint is one way and recognizing that our well-being can be improved by steps that recover biodiversity. And that is in every walk of life. Now, absolutely. Speaking as someone that's worked in mental health services for 10 years, I completely subscribe to the idea that nature is absolutely integral to our well-being. And I, I suppose I feel your excitement about these kind of stories of local projects and initiatives. And I, I suppose I'm wondering, about how do these stories get shared? How do we celebrate? And how do we, because that's how we want other people to kind of pick up on that. And that's become part of what that we want your enthusiasm to dispel across many people to, yeah. to generate change. Well, I'm happy to connect you with all the, uh, all these projects. Again, you can explore Restore at your own leisure and find them all yourself. But I can, you know, I've got a long list of my favorites. Also, anyone you know or work with who are doing podcasts or blogs or videos or tell them all about it because I would like, yeah, I'm fine to give podcasts, but I think these guys are a thousand times better. And yeah, we need an army of people showing how nature can become the choice for local well-being, and then it becomes a reality. So I, yeah, happy to share as much as possible. The first step in the process is understanding the challenges associated with it. What can people do that maybe don't have, unfortunately enough, like us to have those 80 acres that we're going to try and get the benefit for the earth, also the well-being benefits for ourselves and hopefully integrating with our community, which is what we aim to do. But at an individual level, is there any advice or thoughts that people can just do on a case-by-case -case basis? Uh, officially, I'll say go on Restore and donate to loads of the projects and talk about <laughs> them and tell the stories and, and make them the heroes. But it's more to it than that. Obviously, I think we need to have the recognition that 100% of the, con the economy is 100% dependent on nature. We have never sat on a chair that didn't at some point come from nature. You know, everything we engage with has a footprint on nature. And I think if you can enjoy the process of thinking about that footprint and maybe taking little steps, tiny little steps to minimize that footprint, you'll do an unbelievable impact. Every day you engage with a load of, of things that impacted nature. And if you just are mindful of that, and if you can, I'm not saying do it at your own expense, but if you can enjoy the process, it gets really addictive and that leads to massive societal impact. This will probably get me in trouble, but I love Burger King. I eat Burger King loads but I only, I don't eat meat. So I've been limited to their veggie options. But as of late, Burger King have gone massive on their veggie burgers. And right now I'm eating like triple decker cheese, <laughs> or like fake bacon. Like I'm back to being like a massive meat eater, <laughs> but in a veggie world. And like, it's only through the actions of millions of individuals wanting a veggie option that has led to Burger King making the yeah. change. And Burger King's one of the biggest environmental footprints on the planet. And if we can shape that, we are then having massive impact. It obviously also counts in the way we vote and the way we interact with the political world. So, you know, there's loads of examples of policies that have just been unbelievably impactful. Like the example I often go with is Costa Rica about, I don't know the exact dates on this, I think 20 or 30 years ago, they abolished the army and they used all that money for education and for the payment for ecosystem service program, where they just paid local landowners to make nature more beautiful. We're actually in the process in our lab of doing a big biodiversity study to show how unbelievably the country has recovered. The country is now much more diverse, much more beautiful. And as a result, ecotourism thrives and nature is part of the na national identity now. And the economy since that change has absolutely boomed. This is now one of the most economically stable countries in the region. And it is at, like the gold standard for how countries should be moving towards a biodiverse, economically sustainable future. And I think that happened because of all of our individual actions. So yeah, we can all play a part in these mass movements. 
selfishly, as two people are about to embark on our own project with our 80 acres in the hills in Monmouthshire, what advice would you give us at the start of this project? Go on Restore again. <laughs> You've already done that. For me, it starts with just becoming connected to the community. And that is why we built Restore. There's obviously many other ways that you can find connection with community. But the more people you know who are into what you're doing, the easier you're going to find it. I definitely don't know which species grow best there or which, uh, you know, what the soil type is like. And we provide on Restore all that localized data that can give you some of the first steps, but it's meeting local people that will make it come real. And it's meeting the people who know the ecology a thousand times more than I do that will be able to give you those insights. And on top of that, it's meeting those people that forms the basis of networks. And networks are an interesting concept. Like they are the reason that biodiversity works so well because everything depends on everything else and it forms this web of interactions. And it's only when that web is very strong that you get a system that is resilient. The same is true for your individual project. If you can be doing your practice and also know of someone down the road and someone up the hill and so, you know a few others who are also doing it, you probably will have shared knowledge base and shared resources that might give you the chance of collectively looking for funding to improve your the scale of your network. Or if you, for example, ran out of money on the project, you would each individual project would have to look for its own money. But as a collective, you could maybe have one person responsible for the funding for all of them. And it's that's the scalability of the network makes it so much better. Uh, and that's what we do see. Actually, the UK is a great example. There's lots of farming cooperatives and initiatives where different people are forming networks and those networks can be way more resilient. No, I, I love hearing about how it's kind of human relationships, which is fundamental to restoring natural relationships, which makes complete sense, doesn't it? We're all part of the same ecosystem. Totally. Right. Sadly, we are drawing to the close of your precious time. It's been, every time I have an interview, it's been my favorite, but this has been, you know, it's, it's been it's up there with every single one we've had so far. It's so inspirational and really helping me, us, and hopefully listeners on their journey. So any final thoughts? And with that, I suppose any places you think your listeners could go to get better educated and more engaged with the topic? Yeah. I guess what I'd say is you probably don't know of it, but there are thousands of people in every town that are really engaged in the topic. There's no one place. It's it's unbelievable how many people are working in this movement and it's not that hard to find them. We built Restore to help that, but there's loads of other ways you can find all of the people that are doing supplying seeds or generating farms or rewilding landscapes or whatever they're doing, you know, just local farmers markets, they're all over the place. But one place that I do think does a good job is the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. So the UN named this decade as the one in which we're going to turn this trend of biodiversity loss around. And the UN decade has a, it pulls together knowledge and expertise from loads of different places and resources. So you could, it's a great place to go and learn about biodiversity and the impacts you can have. But I guess I'll never be able to summarize the topic. All I can say is everyone everywhere can be engaged in it and make a really powerful difference. Perfect. Well, thank you for time. I do hope that we get an opportunity to either meet in person or we'll speak again soon. Awesome. We'd love that. Oh, I am inspired. Let's go and um, plan things. <laughs> <laughs> no? I, well, I, that, it was brilliant. I really loved that chat. It yeah. was just so Tom's energy and the fact that he believes he's got the best job in the world, which which I now believe him completely has got the best job in the world. I want that job, although certainly... I'm not a professor or, or smart enough to do it. But the fact you have those conversations with such great people, I think that is a little bit of our nugget we, privilege we get from doing this podcast as well. No, absolutely. It was so, I guess, energizing, wasn't it, to hear about all the different projects that are happening locally. And for me, the thing I love about the biodiversity stuff is that the, the kind of the local focus, the fact that things are very much community led and driven, the kind of celebrating the small projects, like it really feels like it's a great fit for what we're trying to achieve here at the Grange Project. You know, if we can provide a space where people can come together, they can connect with nature. And as a result of that, we improve the planet for future generations. What's not to like about that story? Yeah. And a major takeaway for me is it's about connecting with community and I'm not saying bringing community along with you because I don't think that's appropriate. I think it's the opposite. It's fitting in with community, the project, with what they're doing and trying to engage it at the level of what's important to the local people around us, which is really cool. I think what really resonated with me was hearing when we talking about this local projects, was hearing about the benefit 
everybody. And for us, when we're making decisions, we're often thinking about what's the benefit for society, what's the benefit for nature, and what's the benefit economically. And it feels like those projects Tom was describing really fit with that ethos. Yeah, and I'd really recommend anyone listening to go and uh, have a look at the Restore platform. It is super intuitive, super easy to use. It is basically Google Maps, but just repurposed for environmental use. And it's great. It's fascinating. It's fun to explore projects all the way around the world. It's interesting that when we've plotted the Grange project, I can't see any of the projects really anywhere near us. And I'm sure that's not the case. There's, we're in the Monmouth Should We Wedding group on Facebook, and there's 500 people in that group. So there must be other projects. It doesn't matter if it's a small garden, tiny field at the back of your house, wherever it might be, it'd be great to see those projects listed on Restore, just so we can then see who's near us and reach out to them. And that's one thing, feedback to the developers, Tom, if you're listening, is that it'd be great to be able to create a like a network within the platform so that people could belong to, let's say, the Grange Project Network. And if you clicked on the Grange Project, there's a spider lines that go out to other projects nearby who maybe have the same principles or communicate with each other, help each other out. It'd be really nice to see that. And networks are so critical, not just for kind of, as we talked about in the interview, for relationships and kind of feeling resourced and connected and part of something, but equally for nature and the more spaces we can connect. And if we, you know, if you can see that you've got an, a neighbor or who's got a garden and they're trying to do something similar within you know how fantastic because you know that nature has a haven in both locations so i'm a bit of a data geek and one of the other things i loved about the platform is it gives you some estimates around your current carbon storage and the potential storage should you plant the whole site for trees for example and just as a one i guess one quick fact about our place is that it reckons that the current above ground woody carbon storage is 971 tons and the potential storage is 3,150 tonnes. So that's a really cool fact in terms of helping to tell the story about the carbon impact of biodiversity. Yeah, and it just uses Google Maps to then use this image recognition to work out what is a tree, what is grassy, what is boggy, peatland, whatever it might be, and then it makes assumptions based on models, which is quite cool. Now, of course, it is useful, but equally, we are not going to be putting trees across the whole land And there's things like below ground woody carbon, which is actually our biggest opportunity to improve. And then there's also kind of soil organic carbon as well. What's exciting about this is it's obviously going to be there in perpetuity and it's going to continue to take these pictures and then do its analysis. It can show how it's changing over time with your intervention. So it doesn't mean we're going to plant a thousand trees, but we're going to do a whole bunch of different kinds of interventions. And I'd be very interested to see how that changes. Yeah, there's a really cool time lapse feature where you can kind of see over the last five years how things have developed on your particular site. And yeah, we hope that things will look very different here in five years from now. So that pretty much brings us to the end of episode four. It's getting, if possible, more enjoyable every episode we do, and we hope you are enjoying it too. Before we wrap up, there's one last thing to mention. We've had a week work experience graduate with us. Sam has been brilliant. He's been living in with us, which is a pretty big commitment for saying, you know, for a household with three young kids and he's a new grad with no experience of children. Uh, but he's, he's mucked in. Yeah, if we, have we put him off? I didn't, we didn't actually ask him when he left. Oh, I did, but I won't answer that now. <laughs> so, <laughs> but he's been helping us with so many things. We had a little interview with him and recorded just to help, I think, help him with his job applications going forward. But anyway, I'll tag that on the end of this so you can listen to an interview with Sam and his experiences. Also, we'll put a link to his LinkedIn in the bio for the podcast. And I guess that kind of connects into the whole theme of today's interview, which is around kind of relationships in the community. So if anyone out there is listening to the podcast and is thinking, oh, you know, I'd love to come and spend some time, you know, Sam did a whole range of different activities when he was with us. Please do reach out because we'd love to you to come. We'd love to chat. Um, this is all about making this space available to everybody and this journey also accessible to everybody. Last thing to say, if you've enjoyed this, please just pause, take that second. It takes literally a minute or so if you're on Spotify to do a rate. And if you are on iTunes as well, again, it's a quick rate and a, and a sentence, and it just makes all the world of difference. Right, um, I'm looking forward to episode five, and maybe a big announcement will happen. Exciting times. Well, hello to whoever may be listening to this recording. Myself and Sam decided this might be a great opportunity to talk about his work experience over the Grange Project. So by way of introduction, I'm Tom Constable. I'm the founder of the Grange Project and one of the co-hosts on the Wilder podcast. Sam has been with us for a week now, and we want to talk about his experience with it, and hopefully with a view to educating you as a listener uh, as to Sam's experience and the valuable experiences we've had with him. 
So briefly, the Grange project is a very new project about rewilding 80 acres near Monmouthshire. We are a family and we are new to the sector. And so we're going through a journey of discovery of learning how to do it. And Sam's joined us to help us really as well go through the journey and add his knowledge to ours to allow us to push forward the project. First of all, Sam, would you like to say hello? Yes, hello. <laughs> um, and I'll stop speaking soon, I promise, because Sam is the one we want to speak to. However, just giving a bit of background about the work he's been doing. There's a bit of Sam just kind of jumped into kind of the physical labor side of doing some work, helping us maintain some of the paths around the land. We hope people will be able to enjoy the project. Uh, he's been doing a lot of researching and writing, creating baseline blog articles and content around the industry to help educate our community. He's attended all of our meetings, including kind of key meetings with ecologists and conservationists when we had a good walk around. And, you know, Sam was very keen to do that because he wanted to continue to focus on his personal development and understanding the conversations that happened. He has led on scripting and recording for our first video about our no dig veg patch. With that, because impressively, he's also focused on using the, the hardware, the, the, the technology, which I, we haven't got around to learning. So he learned it, he got to grips with it, planned it all out, and then we recorded it and uh, edited it together. And he's also done things like this week's been a very busy week for us. And we've also launched the podcast this week. So he's seen the kind of whole social media launch of that and supported us with that. So it's been a very busy week. And I'm sure I hope that you'll be looking forward to a rest now. Yep. Sam, would you like to introduce yourself and your background, please? Yeah, so... I've got a background in environmental science. I've studied a degree in environmental geography at Cardiff University, and I'm just embarking on the, the early stages of a career in conservation and the environmental space. Being modest there, you got a first, which is um, not, not everyone can say a first from Cardiff. How have you found the week? It's been really enjoyable, yeah. It's been a great experience. I love the project and what you guys are doing here. It's really exciting, and I'm so grateful that you've had me in a yeah, really grateful to have been involved, even in just a small way. Well, I think this week has been more than just a small way, but I mean, thank you for your time. And what would you say has been your biggest takeaways from this small bit of work experience? A couple of days ago, we had two ecologists come and visit. We walked around the land with them, like you said, and they sort of gave advice and suggestions on potential rewilding methods and pointed out bits of biodiversity on the land, which was really interesting. And I always loved the idea of when I'm out walking in nature, having an ecologist to explain the things that we're seeing, <laughs> just because it's so fascinating to me. Uh, I've also gained several new skills along the way. So I've, I've utilized my background in environmental science and used my degree to tweak some blog content for the website. I've had an interesting insight into aspects of outreach and social media how you make your podcasts it's been really really interesting and obviously it's a very important part of launching a project like this and also working at how to use the recording equipment to produce video content and learning about no dig as well has been really interesting the story of you how you actually got in contact i think is key to communicate not every graduate will be proactive in the way that they approach things but you know you they found us somewhere on, on Google or on LinkedIn and then directly connected, sent a message, asked about the project. Very quickly, I got back to you and said, let's have a chat and for a phone call. And again, not my graduates would feel comfortable with that, but you did. We had a good chat and then you came to visit the land and then we came up with a good idea. This, why don't you come and live our house for a week and let's see what kind of experience you can learn, which you said straight away, yes, I'd love to. And not many graduates want to live in a house with three young kids a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and a newborn. Again, you've put up really well with that. And not only that, you just added value. So I think it's really important to mention that. So as this small bit of work experience comes to an end, what are your future plans? Broadly speaking, my overall goal is to play my part in helping to tackle the nature and climate emergencies that we're facing as a society. In terms of next steps, I'm, as I say, navigating the early stages of a career in the environmental and conservation space. So looking out for new opportunities, new experiences to get involved, make a real impact with a measurable output to help make a difference. Brilliant. So the last thing to say from my side is that if anyone's listening to this uh, and you're thinking about you know, reviewing Sam's CV, all I say is that I rage chat with him and see if it's something that you you know worth exploring further that's what i did and it's been a great week and you know the fact you've agreed to do a pseudo podcast again I mean, it's not your natural habitat so to speak but it just shows i think your kind of can do attitude and your willingness to learn new things try new things and that's been really great to see through the week if they're listening to this and they don't have your cv in front of them how can they contact you so you can find me on linkedin 
just search Sam Holding, that's H-A-L-L-I-N-G, or my email address, if you want to contact me directly, is haulingsj27 at gmail.com. Brilliant. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's been a really fascinating insight. 